first things first, gentlemen, how are you? Very good, thank you. Yeah, happy to yeah. be in Holland. Yeah. Very good to have you. So before we jump into kind of where we are now, I'd like to jump back a couple of years. And, and Steve, do you remember the first time you heard Ross sing? Uh, yes, it was a it was a video, and uh, it was sent. Uh, they, they, Russ is a friend of Martin. They worked together, mm. so um, you know we went through loads of people, and we were getting a bit despondent. And then um, we thought, you know, let's really sort of carry on, carry on, and and we rifled through so many different singers online and that. And all of a sudden, there was a, you know, Gary and I think it was Gary who saw it. He was very excited that Martin had shown this video of Ross. And, um, and it was a Queen song, if yeah, I remember show rightly. Yeah, Show Must Go On, yeah. Show Must Go On, and I thought, wow, first of all, he looks great. Don't get, don't get too big in <laughs> man. But, but, you know, and then just the way he attacked this song was, mm. it, it kind of felt right. It felt like he had the tone of, of the, the, you know, the depth of those songs, which were obviously written for a different person. Um, but he had this range, and it's something that, I you know, I've sort of been quick, pretty knocked out about myself is is your sort of low end range that can cope with all the big baritone stuff which was written for for, for tony you know yeah. and he copes with that yet he's got a, a higher range when it comes to all the soulful um sort of um falsetto stuff and 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 that there so yeah very impressed and he's not a bad guy either I'm all right. I'm all right. he's all right that helps it does you say, you say you, the band was feeling a little bit despondent at, at, at a certain point. Yeah. Was there ever a moment where you thought, well, maybe this isn't going to work out, we're not going to... No, we didn't think that. It's just it took a little bit longer. We always sort of, we knew some, someone's out there. Sure. Uh, it's just a ma it, wasn't, it wasn't to be at that point. And, you know, I remember thinking there was, there was uh, one or two guys that... You know the rest of the band liked and and I were you know it worked in, for everybody you know Not, there was we had people but it wasn't complete it, they didn't have everything that we deserved really I think for a band like Spandau you know you should have all all the qualities that Spandau want in a, in a singer or any musician and uh, I, I don't think we should accept anything less than that mm. and um, you know he's, that person was out there and. It might have taken even longer. So luckily enough, it, uh, Ross came into our lives, and you know we found you, you found us, and we were able to get on with it. You know, mm -hmm. and this is where we are now. And I believe Ross, you uh, well, like you mentioned, uh, you know Martin from uh, Million Dollar Quartet, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. How familiar were you with the music of Spandau Ballet at that time? Uh, yeah, very familiar. Um, I'd listened to them growing up. They were a staple in my household, and. Uh, I, I always remember a time uh, that my dad used to play gold in the car and we used to sing along. Um, so yeah, no, I was, I was very familiar. Um, there, there was a couple of songs that I wasn't as familiar with, but um, I guess that's with every band. Um, but yeah, I was uh, over the moon to get the job. Yeah, what was that? Did you know they were looking for? What was that point like? So it's, it's, it's a funny story actually. So um, basically, um, so I was playing Elvis and Million Dollar Quartet, and mm -hmm. I formed a really nice relationship with Martin. And um, it was actually around the time that George Michael died, and, and um, Martin knew him really well. And I could see something wasn't wasn't right with Martin. And then I found out, and we I sort of consoled him over that, and we became really close during that um, period of time. And then. Um, I used to say, oh, come on, let's have a jam, let's have a jam. So we'd, we'd and then anyway, so months went past and uh, I saw, um, the show had finished and I, I saw an advert on, on Instagram, um, say from a casting director friend of mine who said, uh, lead singer required for established UK band for arena <laughs> tour. Now, about two years ago, I kind of gave up on the idea of being a lead singer. I'd, I'd wanted to be, be a lead singer all my life, you know, and um, I was in a metal band when I was a kid and stuff, but never really worked out so I saw it and said have to go for it so went for it but I wasn't told who the band were mm. um, and then Martin uh, I, I sent I sent through the videotape anyway to the casting director and then about two weeks later I got a random phone call from Martin oh hey man how's it going can't wait to see you in a few weeks <laughs> and that and I was like oh are we hanging out he was like no man you're coming in for Spandau and I was like are you guys playing a concert? Oh, am I getting a ticket? What's the deal? He was like, no, man, you're auditioning for the lead singer, man. And I was like, no way. It's, that, that thing is you. Okay, so anyway, and then it was just like pedal to the metal for me. Research, research, get the job done. You know, make sure I had the, had the, the 
the the lyrics, the, the, the lyrics, and 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 the yeah. and the tools and the mm. that they that they were yeah. looking for. When you delve into a band like Spano Bella, who, who's been around, who, who did have a, a big impact, uh, what do you notice when you kind of really study it about what what they made? Um, well, I mean, you know, they they defined an era, um, but in 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 defining an era, they also they also broke the mold of the era, if that makes any sense, uh, because they. they I wouldn't say that Spandau have a definitively 80s sound. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not that at mm -hmm. all. They're they're very experimental and and, and progressive <coughs> in a way, which really appeals to me. Um, I love the songwriting. Um, I love the fact that the, the the musicianship within everyone is so strong. I mean, this guy plays everything. <laughs> There's nothing he can't play. He's got you know one of the finest musical ears I've ever worked with, and um, and yeah, it's uh, yeah, I. I've forgotten the question, but um, yeah. Well, th it's interesting that you mentioned uh, Steve's kind of uh, multifaceted nature because uh, you kind of say that about Ross as well, the, that he had everything. Mm. And how important to you is that as a musician to, to not be one dimensional? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a person, I, I think the reason why I like to play different instruments is because I get very frustrated tied to one thing, you know. Um, but, and Right, Russ is right. We are progressive. We've always been progressive, Spandau. We, we, we did help to make the mold and then broke it. You know, tracks like Chant Number no. One. We, mm -hmm. we had brass on our records. We suddenly went from cool electronica to to funky sort of congas That's and chant everything. Number chant one. Number One. When you were releasing these albums and these songs, yeah. did it feel um, to you like risks or was uh, it yeah. just? Definitely risk, risky, yeah, I mean the second album is a classic example really, you know, mm. we just deviated from the, the electronica, that, that we synth based sounds, to, the, to really esoteric percussion and, you know, even t slightly chill out and down tempo, which, which had chart number one on the album, but the, the sort of B-side was, was very sort of, very sort of hippie sounding in a way, with all these percussion instruments. I didn't play any, I was playing guitar on the first one album, then I went on percussion. So I was experimenting with tablas and things like mm. that. And, um, and, ja and, and uh, Gary had a cheng, um, which was, was a Japanese, uh, um, I think it's Japanese, it might be Chinese. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and just literally finding instruments and writing around those instruments. Mm. Uh, and that was very sort of experimental. It was probably the, the, the worst selling album we ever made. It, but, um, you know, we were lucky to get a hit out of it and that enabled us to carry on with the next. And I suppose those kinds of moments are important as musicians as well to get you to the next album. To yeah, work well, through. yeah, I mean, we, that doesn't happen. These days, we'd have got well, dropped because there's no, there's no loyalty to, to an artist anymore, isn't it? Seems to be no A&R anymore, no long, no one from a record company, we, we, they, do, they, are, they are there, but their hands are tied. So if you have a vision of a band and you sort of see the, the potential of a band or an artist, uh, they're not given the time I to think develop. These guys, these guys take on a lot more jobs now as yeah. well than just artists they're in just the repertoire. They're just focusing on They're that. doing yeah. so many different things. Yeah. yeah, which which would mean that if that was to occur now, we, we wouldn't be around for the true album. That that's happening to bands all the time. You know, artists that are, that have that got the potential but are not quite ready yet. They're not given that that time to develop anymore, and I think that's tragic. I think that's got to turn. It's got to change, and I think it will. A and R people and people with visions uh, that can spot it and nurture and get the best out of an artist. They might be like a 16 year old kid, like Kate Bush. You know, that's classic. You know, Dave, Dave Gilmore from uh, Pink Floyd right. recognised Kate, the talent in Kate Bush, and, and said, like, let's hold her back. She's not ready. She's going to get ruined, spoiled. So we got to hold back on her for a year or two, and they did before they released Wuthering Heights. Mm. And, and she wrote a song about it and called A Man With a Child in His Eyes, you know, as a payback. That's a, that's a very interesting point. And is that due to the, the business side of things becoming more important than the art, artistic yeah, side? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, in a lot of circumstances, situations, you get um, people in a room putting together uh, an idea. And the last thing in place is the actual artist. That slots in right at the end. Mm. That will turn on its head again, I think. It always goes around the cycles, these things. It's a cultural thing as well. I mean, mm. look at the, the, we have such a disposable culture these days. And, and, you know, music's part of that. It's swipe. 
swipe, yeah. nah, nah, I'll That's come it, back yeah. to it. You know, I'll stick on a Netflix thing. I'll think, oh, I'll watch the next bit later. So I'll swipe and do something yeah. else. Attention you know, span. Attention yeah. span. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right.